past. The poor we shifters cannot get the rest. Shift in bobbins, coarse and fine. They fairly make you work for your ten and nine. Coketown, the keynote. Coketown was a triumph of fact. It was a town of red brick, or of brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But as matters stood, it was a town of unnatural red and black, like the painted face of a savage. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys, out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever, and never got uncoiled. It had a black canal in it, and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye, and vast piles of buildings full of windows where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long, and where the piston of the steam engine worked monotonously up and down like a melancholy elephant in a state of madness. Fact, fact, fact. Everywhere in the material aspects of the town, fact, fact, fact. Everywhere in the immaterial. Thomas Gradgrind, benefactor of the Coketown School and currently addressing the schoolmaster therein, was all fact, fact, fact. Now, what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will ever be of any service to them. This is the principle in which I bring up my own children, and this is the principle in which I bring up these children. Stick to the facts, sir. The scene was a plain, bare, monotonous vault of a schoolroom, and the speaker, Thomas Gradgrind, a square, knobby, dry, inflexible, dictatorial man who addressed his remarks to Mr. Machokum Child, the schoolmaster. The two men swept with their eyes the inclined plane of little vessels there and then arranged in order before them, ready to have imperial gallons of facts poured into them until they were full to the brim. Indeed, as Mr. Gradgrind viewed the students, he seemed a kind of cannon, loaded to the muzzle with facts and prepared to blow them clean out of the regions of childhood at one discharge. Girl number 20. I don't know that girl. Who was that girl? Girl number 20. Sissy Jupe, sir. Uh, Sissy's not a name. Don't call yourself Sissy. Call yourself Cecilia. It's father as calls me Sissy, sir. Uh, then he had no business to do so. Tell him he mustn't. Cecilia Jupe. Let me see. What is your father? He belongs to the horse riding at the circus. If uh, you um, we don't want to know anything about that here. You mustn't tell us about that here. Uh, your father breaks horses, don't he? If you please, sir. When they can get me to break, they do break horses in the uh, no, ring, No, we sir. don't want to know anything about the ring here. Very well, then. Describe your father as a horse breaker. Oh, I dare say he doctors sick horses. Oh, yes, sir. Very well, then. Your father is a veterinary surgeon, a farrier, and a horse breaker. Now, girl number 20, give me your definition of a horse. Girl number 20, unable to define a horse. Girl number 20 possessed of no facts in reference to one of the commonest of animals. Some boy's definition of a horse. Oh, bits like yours. Quadruped, graminivorous, 40 teeth, namely 24 grinders, 4 eye teeth and 12 incisive, sheds coats in the spring, in marshy country sheds hoofs too, hoofs hard but requiring to be shod with iron, age known by marks in the mouth. There, girl number 20, now you know what a horse is. <laughs> now. Let me ask you, boys and girls, if you were to paper your room, would you use a wallpaper having uh, representations of horses upon it? After a pause, one half of the children cried out in chorus, Yes, yes sir. sir! Upon which the other half, seeing in the gentleman's face that yes was wrong, cried out in chorus, No, no sir. sir! As the custom is in these examinations. Of course, no. And why wouldn't you? Another pause. One corpulent, slow boy with a wheezy manner of breathing ventured an answer. Because I wouldn't paper a room at all. I would paint it. Uh, oh, but you must paper it. You must paper it whether you like it or not. Don't tell us you wouldn't paper it. <clears throat> now, I'll begin again. 
I will explain to you why you would not paper a room with representations of horses. Do you ever see horses going up and down the sides of rooms in reality, in fact? Do you? No, no sir. Of course, no. Why, then, you're not to see anywhere what you don't see, in fact. You're not to have anywhere what you don't have, in fact. Now, I will try you again. Now, suppose you were to carpet your room. Would you use a carpet having representations of flowers upon it? Would you? There being by this time a, a general conviction that no was always the right answer to this gentleman, the chorus of no, no was sir. very strong. Only a few feeble stragglers said yes. Among them, yes, sir. Sissy Jupe. So, girl number 20, you would carpet your room, or your husband's room, if you were a grown woman and had a husband with representations of flowers, would you? And why would you? If you please, sir. I'm very fond of flowers. And is that why you would put tables and chairs upon them? And have people walk over them with heavy boots? Oh, it wouldn't hurt them, sir. They would crush and wither, if you please, sir. They would be the pictures of what was very pretty and pleasant. And I would fancy... Aye! Aye, but that's it. You're not to fancy. You are not, Cecilia Duke, to do anything of that kind. You don't walk upon flowers in reality. You can't be allowed to walk upon flowers in carpets. You never find that foreign birds and butterflies come and patch upon your crockery. You can't have foreign birds and butterflies painted on your crockery. You never find quadrupeds going up and down walls. You can't have quadrupeds represented on walls. This is a new discovery. This is fact. This is taste. Uh, now, Mr. Machokum, child, if you proceed to the next lesson, I should be happy to avoid your mode of procedure. Twice two is four, twice three is six, twice four is eight, twice five is ten, twice six is twelve, twice six is twelve. And so, Mr. Bachocum Child, the schoolmaster, began in his best manner. He and some 140 other schoolmasters had been lately turned at the same time in the same factory on the same principles like so many pianoforte legs. He'd been put through an immense variety of paces, and it answered volumes of head-breaking questions. Orthography, etymology, and syntax and prosody, biography, astronomy, geography, cosmography, algebra, land surveying and leveling, drawing from models. 12 and 6. And vocal music were all at the ends of his 10 chilled fingers. Ah, uh, rather overdone, Mr. Machokum Child. If only he had learned a little bit less, how infinitely better he might have taught much more. And 12 times 12 is 144. Mr. Gradgrind walked homeward from the school in a state of considerable satisfaction. It was his school, and he intended it to be a model. He intended every child in it to be a model, just as the young Gradgrinds were all models. There were five young Gradgrinds, and they were models, every one. No little Gradgrind had ever seen a face in the moon. No little grad grind had ever learnt the silly jingle, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. No little grad grind had ever associated a cow in a field with that famous cow with the crumpled horn who tossed the dog who worried the cat. It had only been introduced to a cow as a graminivorous ruminating quadruped with several stomachs. Mr. Gradgrind had reached the outskirts of town when his ears were invaded by the sound of music coming from a wooden pavilion which proclaimed itself to be Sleary's Horse Riding Circus. He took no heed of these trivialities until he noticed that at the rear of the tent were a number of children striving to peep in at the hidden glories of the place. This brought him to a stop. Now to think of these vagabonds attracting young rabble from a model school. Mr. Gradgrind took his spectacles out of his waistcoat to look for any child he knew by name and might order off when, what did he behold? But his own metallurgical daughter, Louisa, peeping with all her might through a hole in a board, and his own mathematical son, Thomas, abasing himself on the ground to catch but a hoof of the graceful equestrian Tyrolean flower act. Thomas, Louisa, what in the name of wonder, idleness, and folly do you hear? We wanted to see what it was like. What it was like? Yes, Father. Thomas, though I have the fact before me, I find it difficult to believe that you, with your education and resources, could have brought your sister to a place like this. I brought him, Father. I asked him to come. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. It makes Thomas no better, and it makes you worse, Louisa. Thomas and you, to whom the circle of the sciences is open, 
Thomas and you, who may be said to be replete with facts. Thomas and you, who have been trained to a mathematical exactness. Thomas and you, here in this most degraded circumstance. I am amazed. I was tired, Father. I've been tired a long time. Tired of what? I, I don't know of what. Of everything. Say I think... not another word. You are childish. I will hear no more. What would your best friend say, Louisa? Do you attach no value to the good opinion? What would Mr. Bounderby say? At the mention of this name, Louisa stole a look at her father remarkable for its intense and searching character. He saw nothing of it, for before he had looked at her again, she had cast down her eyes. What would Mr. Bounderby say? Said Mr. Gradgrind as he led them home to Stone Lodge. This same Mr. Bounderby was even now awaiting their arrival at the drawing room of Stone Lodge. He was a rich man, a banker, merchant, and manufacturer. He was a man of some seven or eight and forty, but looked older. He had not much hair. One might have fancied he had talked it off. Standing on the hearth rug, he was in the midst of delivering some observations to Mrs. Gradgrind on the circumstance of its being his birthday. That's the way I spent my ninth birthday. By my tenth birthday, I hadn't a shoe to my foot. As to a stocking, I didn't know such a thing by name. I passed the day in the ditch and a night in the pigsty. That's the way I spent my tenth birthday. Not that a ditch was new to me, for I was born in a ditch. Mrs. Gradgrind was a little, thin, white, pink-eyed bundle of shawls of surpassing feebleness, mental and bodily. I do hope it was a dry ditch. No, as wet as a sup, a foot of water in it. For years, ma'am, I was one of the most miserable little wretches ever seen. Why, I was so ragged and dirty, you wouldn't have touched me with a pair of tongs. But surely your mother must... My mother! Bolted, ma'am, left me to my grandmother, the wickedest and worst old woman that ever lived. Why, if I should happen to get a little pair of shoes by any chance, she would take them off me and sell them for drink. Why, I've known that grandmother of mine to lie in her bed and drink 14 glasses of liquor before breakfast. Mrs. Gradgrind, weakly smiling, looked as she always did, like an indifferently executed transparency of a small female figure without enough light behind it. As soon as I was old enough, I ran away. Then, instead of one old woman knocking me about and starving me, everybody of all ages knocked me about and starved me. I pulled through it, though. Nobody threw me a rope. Vagabond. Errand boy. Vagabond. Laborer. Porter. Clerk. Chief. Manager, small partner, Josiah Bounderby of Coketown. Tell Josiah Bounderby of Coketown of your district schools and your model schools and your training schools and your whole kettle of fish schools. And Josiah Bounderby of Coketown tells you plainly he hadn't such advantages. You may force him to swallow boiling fat, but you shall never force him to suppress the facts of his life. Being heated when he arrived at this climax, Josiah Bounderby stopped just as Mr. Gradgrind and his two young culprits arrived. Seeing his friend in the drawing room, Mr. Gradgrind gave Louisa a reproachful look which plainly said, Behold your Bounderby. Well, what's the matter? What is young Thomas in the dumps about? He spoke of young Thomas, but he looked at Louisa. We were peeping at the circus, mm. and father caught us. Mm. Mrs. Gradgrind? I should have soon expected to find my children reading poetry. Thomas and Louisa, I declare, why, you're enough to make one regret ever having had a family at all. Mm -hmm. I, I have a great mind to say that I wish I hadn't. Then what would you have done, I should like to know? Now, oh, go and do something logical directly. The children dutifully retired, and Mrs. Gradgrind once more died away, and nobody minded her. Bounderby, I make no apology to you for saying I'm very much vexed by this discovery. I have systematically devoted myself to the education of the reason of my family. And now it would appear if something has crept into Thomas and Louisa's mind that has nothing to do with reason. And then comes the question, 
In what has this vulgar curiosity its rise? Now, stop a bit. You have one of those circus children in your school. Cecilia Duke, by name. Now, stop a bit. How did she get there? Oh, the fact is, I saw the girl myself. She applied especially at the house to be admitted as not regularly ah. belonging to the town and... Yes. You are right. Bounderby, you are now right. Now, stop a bit. Louisa saw her when she came. Louisa and... did see her. Now, I'll tell you what. Grad Grant, get rid of this girl and there's an end of it. Do it at once. I am much of your opinion. I have the father's address. Will you accompany me? Why, certainly. As long as you do it at once. Being left on his own while Mr. Gradgrind fetched the address, Mr. Bounderby took the opportunity to poke his head into the children's study. <clears throat> it's all right, Louisa. It's all right, young Thomas. You won't do so anymore. And I'll answer for its being all over with father. Huh? Well, Louisa, that's worth a kiss, isn't it? You can take one, Mr. Bounderby. Always my pet, ain't you, Louisa? He went his way, but she stood on the same spot, rubbing the cheek he had kissed with her handkerchief until it was burning red. What are you about, Lou? You'll rub a hole in your face. You can cut the piece out with your penknife if you like, Tom. I wouldn't cry. When at last, Mr. Bounderby and Mr. Gradgrind came to the temporary dwelling of Sleary's horse riding, they found Sissy Jupe hurrying into the house. You, Jupe, take this gentleman and me to see your father. We want to speak with him. The girl led them up some steep corner stairs to her father's room. But when she looked into that dark recess, she was very much surprised to find it empty. Father must have gone down to the booth, sir. I don't know why he should go there, but he must be there. I'll bring him back in a minute. What does she mean, a minute? It's more than a mile off. By your leaves, gentlemen. A young man suddenly appeared at the door and walked into the room with his hands in his pockets. It was you, gentlemen. I believe we're wishing to see Jupe. It was. I sent his daughter to fetch him, but I can't wait there for if you please. I will I'll leave a message for him with you. I don't know that I can oblige you there, sir. Uh, you may not be aware, for perhaps you've not been much in the audience, uh, that Jupe has missed his tip very often lately. What? Well, what has he missed? Uh, missed his tip. His tip? Uh, didn't do what he ought to do. Was short in his leaps and bad in his tumbling. It's been the way with him more and more lately. His joints are stiff. He's getting used up. If you were to give me a message for Jupe, <laughs> it's my opinion he'll never get it. Sissy will never believe it of him, but it's pretty plain to me. He's off. Off? Do you mean to say he's deserted his daughter? Aye. It's a remarkable fact, sir, that it, it cut that man deeper to know that his daughter knew of his being booed night after night than to cut and run. <laughs> good. This is good, Grant Grant. A man so fond of his daughter, he runs away from her. <laughs> this is devilish good. I'll tell you what, young man. I haven't always occupied my present station in life. You may be astonished to hear it, but my mother ran away from me. I'm not at all astonished to hear it. What? But I'll tell you why Sissy Jupe will never believe it, sir. Because those two were one. She seemed to dote upon him. And yet, I seen him send her out in an error not an hour ago and slip out the back with a bundle under his arm, taking his dog Merrylegs with him. <laughs> hmm. If you were to have come here tonight, sir, for the purpose of doing Sissy Jupe any little service, it would be very fortunate and well-timed. Very fortunate and well-timed. On the contrary, I came to tell him that she must no longer attend the school. Still, if he really has left her, without any connivance on her part, I might find a position for her in my own household. Mr. Bounderby looked aghast at this notion and would have ca cautioned against it had not the various members of Sleary's company gathered and gradually insinuated themselves into the room. Last of all appeared Mr. Sleary, a stout man with one fixed eye and one loose eye, a voice like the efforts of a broken old pair of bellows and a muddled head which was never sober and never drunk. Oh, Squire! Your servant. <laughs> oh, this is a bad piece of business, this is. You've heard of my clown, who I suppose has disappeared? At this moment, Sissy Jupe ran into the room. When she saw them all assembled, and saw their looks, and saw no father, she broke into the most deplorable cry. Oh, my dear father. 
My good, kind father, where are you gone? You're going to try to do me some good, I know. You're going away for my sake, I'm sure. Look how miserable and helpless you'll be without me. Poor, poor father, until you come back. Oh, it's an infernal fame. Upon my soul, it is. Now, good people, all this is a wanton waste of time. Let the girl understand the fact. Here, what's your name? Your father has absconded, deserted you, and you mustn't expect to see him again as long as you live. Oh, now, look at his squire. My opinion is that you better cut it short and drop it. Or I'm down if I don't believe my people here will pick you out of the window. The members of Sleary's horse riding moved ominously toward Mr. Bounderby, who shifted his bulk uncomfortably. Now, Joop, I'm willing to provide for you, educate you, and take charge of you, and return for certain household duties. But you must decide here and now whether to accompany me or remain here. And you must agree to have no further dealing with your friends who are here at present. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, the only observation I will make to you, Duke, in the way of influencing your decision, is that it is highly desirable to have a sound, practical education, and that even your father seems to have known and felt as much. But when father comes back, how will he ever find me if I go away? He must find Mr. Sleary. He will tell him where you went. Oh, give me my clothes. Give me my clothes before I break my heart. Missy embraced all her friends, and at last came to Mr. Sleary, who took both her hands in his own. Farewell, Cecilia. Be obedient to the squire and forget us. But if when you're grown up and well off and married, you come across any horse riding ever, give us up a speak if you can and think you might do worse. People must be amused, squire, somehow. They can't always be a working, nor yet can they always be a working. Learning. Make the best of us, not the worst. Make the best of us, not the worst. The Sleary philosophy was propounded as the two gentlemen and Sissy Jupe went down the stairs until it lost them in the darkness of the street. Do they think of me at home? Do they ever think of me? I who shared their every I who mingled in the plea. Let us strike the keynote again before pursuing our tune. When she was some half a dozen years younger, Louisa was overheard to begin a conversation with her brother one day by saying, Tom, I wonder... Upon which Mr. Gradgrind stepped forth into the light. Louisa, never wonder. Herein lay the spring of the mechanical art and mystery of educating the reason without stooping to the cultivation of the sentiments and affections. Never wonder. And yet, over the years, Louisa would wonder. And here she sat now, with her brother Tom by her side, gazing thoughtfully into the fire. I am sick of my life, Lou. I hate it altogether. I hate everybody in it, except you. I don't know what this jolly old jaundiced jail would be without you, Lou. Indeed, Tom. For I often sit here wondering and think how unfortunate it is for me that, that I can't reconcile you to home any better than I'm able. I don't know what other girls know. I can't sing or dance. I can't talk to you for as to lighten your mind, for I never see any amusing sights or read any amusing books. Uh, never mind, Lou. I don't miss anything in you. Besides, when I go to live with old Bounderby, I'll have my revenge. I'll get about and see something and hear something. I'll recompense myself for the way in which I've been brought up. But Mr. Bounderby thinks his father thinks, and is a great deal rougher, and not half so kind. Oh, I don't mind that. I shall very well know how to manage and smooth old Bounderby. <laughs> and what is your great mode of managing and smoothing, Tom? Is it a secret? It's you. You are his little pet. You are his favorite. He'll do anything for you. When he says to me what I don't like, I shall simply say to him, my sister Lou will be hurt and disappointed, Mr. Bounderby. She always used to tell me she was sure you would be easier with me than this. <laughs> That'll bring him about. 
or nothing will. Tom, do you look forward with any satisfaction to this move to Mr. Bounderby's? Well, there's one thing to be said for it. It will be getting away from home. It will be getting away from home, yes, but I wonder if, if it Wondering won't... again. I have such unmanageable thoughts. They will wonder. These renegade thoughts were interrupted by a quiet knock at the door, followed by Sissy Jupe. Pardon me, Miss Louisa, but your father's come on with Mr. Bounderby. They're in the drawing room if you should like to speak with them. Come on, Lou. If you come, there's a good chance of old Bounderby asking me to dinner. And if you don't, there's none. Oh, in a minute. Let me have a word or two with Sissy first. Oh, all right. But don't be too long. I've seen very little of you, Sissy. How are you getting on? Miss Louisa. It would be a fine thing to be you. I should know so much, and all that is difficult to me now would be so easy then. You might not be the better for it, Sissy. Well, I should not be the worse, Miss Louisa. <laughs> I don't know about that. But if you please, Miss Louisa, I am, oh, so stupid. You don't know what a stupid girl I am. All through school hours, I make mistakes. Mr. Machokum Child calls me up over and over again regularly to make mistakes. I can't help them. They seem to come naturally to me. And Mr. Machokum Child never makes any mistakes himself, I suppose, Sissy. Oh, no. He knows everything. Today, for instance, Mr. Machokum Child was explaining to us about natural prosperity. National, I think it must have been. National prosperity. And he said, now this schoolroom is a nation, and in it there are 50 millions of money. Isn't this a prosperous nation? Girl number 20, isn't this a prosperous nation? And aren't you in a thriving state? And what did you say? Miss Louise, I said I didn't know. I thought I couldn't know whether it was a prosperous nation or not, or whether I was in a thriving state or not, unless I knew who had got the money and whether any of it was mine. But that had nothing to do with it. It was not in the figures at all. That was a great mistake of yours. Yes, Miss Louise, I know it was now. And then Mr. Machogum Child said, this schoolroom is an immense town. And in it, there are a million of inhabitants, and only five and twenty of them are starved to death in the streets in the course of a year. What is your remark on that proportion? And my remark was, for I couldn't think of a better one, that I thought it must be just as hard upon those who were starved, whether the others were a million or a million million. And that was wrong, too. Of course it was. And then he said he'd try me once more. And he said, here are the stutterings. Statistics? Statistics of accidents upon the sea. And I find that in a given time, a hundred thousand persons went to sea on long voyages, and only five hundred of them were drowned or burnt to death. What is the percentage? And I said, Miss, I said it was nothing. Nothing, Sissy? Nothing, Miss, to the relations and friends of the people who were killed. I shall never learn. And the worst of it all is that although my poor father wished me so much to learn, and although I'm so anxious to learn because he wished me to, I'm afraid I don't like it. Oh, do look sharp for old Bounderby, Lou. He'll be off if you don't look sharp. Oh, very well. Don't fret now, sissy. You'll be wiser by and by. Mang the noise of wheels in motion in a dark, unhealthy den. Heaven's bright sky shines here never. Clouds a dust eternal rain. In the hardest working part of Coketown, in the innermost fortifications of that ugly citadel where nature was as strongly bricked out as killing airs and gases were bricked in, among the multitudinous workers of Coketown, generically called the hands, lived a certain Stephen Blackpool, 40 years of age. Stephen looked older, but he had had a hard life. It is said that every life has its roses and its thorns. There seemed, however, to have been a mistake in Stephen's case, whereby somebody else had become possessed of his roses, and he had become possessed of the same somebody else's thorns in addition to his own. An unfortunate early marriage left Stephen with a wretched wife, a drunken, loathsome creature whose only charity towards Stephen was a habit of prolonged absences for which he paid dearly. One night, when Stephen had come wearily back to his dwelling, he stumbled into something halfway to the hearth. Oh, have the mercy, woman, though, us come back again. Aye, lad, what? You're there. Aye, <coughs> back again. 
Back again, back again, and back ever so often. Yes, back. Why not? Roused by the unmeaning violence with which she cried it out, she scrambled up and stood supporting herself with her shoulders against the wall. I'll sell thee off again, and I'll sell thee off again, and I'll sell thee off a score of times. Come away from the bed. Tis mine. I've a right to it. The next day, Stephen bent over his loom, quiet, watchful, and steady, a special contrast to the crashing, smashing, tearing piece of mechanism at which he labored. When the noon bell rang, he came out of the hot mill into the damp wind and walked towards a hill on which his principal employer lived. Mr. Bounderby was dining on a chop and sherry. Would his servant say that one of the hands begged leave to speak to him? There was nothing troublesome against Stephen Blackpool. Yes, he might come in. Well, Stephen, what's the matter with you? You've never been one of the unreasonable ones. You don't expect to be set up in a coach and six and fed on turtle soup and venison with a gold spoon, as a good many of them do. Therefore, I know you've not come to make a complaint. No, no, sir. Sure, I, I come for nothing of the kind. I come to ask you your advice. I was married Easter Monday, 19 years in Langendree. She were a young lass, pretty enough, with good accountants of herself. Well, she went bad soon. Oh, not along of me. God knows I was not an unkind husband to her. I have heard all this before. She took to drink and left off work and sold the furniture, pawned the clothes, and played old gooseberry. I will patiently. The more fool you, I think. I will very patiently. I, I tried to wean her for her. To her and her, I tried. Ah, uh, come on. Many's the time and found all vanished as I had in the world and her without sense left her bless herself lying on bare ground. Now, I done it not once, not twice. Twenty time. From bad to worse, from worse to worse, and she left me. She disgraced herself every way, bitter and bad. She come back. She come back, she come back. I, I paid her to keep away from me. These five years I paid her. I lived hard and sad, but not ashamed and fearful of the minutes of my life. Last night, I went home, and there she was. Tommy Ashton. I was acquainted with all this, you know, long ago, except the last clause. It's a bad job, that's what it is. You had better have been satisfied as you were and not got married. However, it's too late to say that. I come to ask you, sir, how can I be rid of this woman? What do you mean? What are you talking about? You took her for better or worse. I won't be rid of her. I, I can't bear it any longer. I have written the papers that great folk are not bonded together so fast for better or worse. Oh but can be set free from their misfortunate marriages. I won't be ridden of this woman, and I want to know how. Know how? If I do her any hurt, sir, there's a lot to punish me. Of course there is. If I flee from her, there's a lot to punish me. Of course there is. If I marry to the dear lass, there's a lot to punish of me. Of course there is. Now, in God's name, show me law to help me. Now, there's a sanctity in this relation of life, and must be kept up. No, 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 don't do not say that, sir. Mine's a grievous case. And I, I wish, if you'd be so good, to know the law that helps me. Well, I'll tell you what. There is such a law. But it's not for you. It costs money. It costs a mint of money. Why, it would cost you, I suppose, from a thousand to fifteen hundred pound, perhaps twice the money. There's no other law. Certainly not. Why didn't say is a model. Hmm? It is just a model altogether, and the sooner I'm dead, the better. Now, don't talk nonsense, my good fellow, about things you don't understand. And don't you go call on the institutions of your country a model, or you'll find yourself in a real model one of these fine mornings. Now, you've always been a steady hand hitherto, and it's my opinion, and so I'll tell you plainly. You are turning into the wrong road. I see traces of turtle soup and venison and gold spoon in this. Yes, I do. By the Lord Harry, I do. And so, with a deep sigh, Stephen left Mr. Bounderby and made his way down into the monstrous serpents of smoke which coiled themselves forever and ever over Coketown and where the melancholy mad elephants, polished and oiled up for the day's monotony, were at their heavy exercise again. 
A year or two has passed in the Gradgrind household, long before Mr. Gradgrind deemed Sissy Jupe's continuance at school useless, but granted that she was an affectionate, good, earnest young woman and useful to the family. He was somewhat startled one day to find that Louisa had blossomed into a, suddenly into a lovely young woman. Uh, young Thomas, on the other hand, now living with Mr. Bounderby, had become a gentleman of pleasure and not quite a prepossessing one. One evening, Louisa was once again before the fire when Tom paid her rather rare and unexpected visit with a particular subject on his mind. Tom. <laughs> Did you miss me, Dan? Yes, of course. I say, um, has Father said anything particular to you today? No, but he said he wished to do so in the morning. Do you know where he is tonight? No. Then I'll tell you. He's with old Bounderby. They're having a regular confab at the bank. I say, Lou, you are very fond of me, ain't you? Indeed I am, Tom, though I hardly ever see you anymore since you've gone to live with Mr. Bounderby. Well, sister of mine, we might be so much oftener together, mightn't we? Always together, almost. Mightn't we? It would do me a great deal of good, Louis, if you were to make up your mind to... You know what. <laughs> it would be a splendid thing for me. It would be uncommonly jolly. Uh, I thought I'd just come and hint to you what was going on. I can't stay tonight. I'm engaged with some fellows. You won't forget how fond you are of me, Lou. No, Tom. I won't forget. And so the next morning, Louisa repaired to her father's study at the appointed hour and sat near his table, looking out to the tall chimneys and the long tracts of smoke looming in the heavy distance gloomily. My dear Louisa, I want you to pay serious attention to the conversation we are now going to have together. You have been so well trained, and you do, I'm happy to say, such justice to the education you have received that I have perfect confidence in your good sense. You're not impulsive, you're not romantic, and you're accustomed to view everything from the strong, dispassionate ground of reasons and calculations. From this ground alone, I know that you will view and consider what I am going to communicate. My dear Louisa, you are the subject of a proposal of marriage that's been made to me, my dear. A proposal of marriage, my dear. I hear you, Father. I am attending, I assure you. Why, you're even more dispassionate than I expected, Louisa. I have undertaken to tell you then that, in short, Mr. Bounderby has informed me that he has long watched your progress with particular interest and pleasure, and has long hoped that the time might ultimately arrive when he should ask for your hand in marriage. That time has now come. Father, do you think I love Mr. Bounderby? Well, really, my child, I, I cannot take upon myself to say. Father, do you ask me to love Mr. Bounderby? No, Louise, I asked you nothing. Father, does Mr. Bounderby ask me to love him? My dear Louise, this is a difficult question to answer. Difficult to answer it, yes or no? Certainly, my child. Because the answer depends so materially upon the sense in which we use the expression love. Now, Mr. Bounderby does not do you the injustice and does not do himself the injustice of pretending to anything fanciful, fantastic, and am I using uh, synonymous terms, sentimental. Therefore, perhaps the expression itself might be a little misplaced. What would you advise me to use in its stead, Father? Well, my dear Louisa, I would advise you to approach the question as you have been accustomed to approach every question simply as one of tangible fact. Now, adhering strictly to fact, 
You must state to yourself, does Mr. Bounderby ask me to marry him? Yes, he does. The sole remaining question is, shall I marry him? Oh, I will leave you to judge for yourself. From the beginning, she had sat looking at him fixedly. As he now leaned back in his chair and bent his eyes upon her, perhaps he might have seen one wavering moment in her when she was impelled to throw herself upon his breast and give him the pent-up confidences of her heart. But the moment shot away into the plumless depths of the past to mingle with all the lost opportunities that are drowned there. Are you consulting the chimneys of the Coke Town Works, Louisa? There seems to be nothing there but languid and monotonous smoke. And yet when night comes, fire bursts out, Father. Well, of course I know that. I fail to see the application of the remark. Oh, what's the use? Uh, uh, use? What use, my dear? Mr. Bounderby asks me to marry him. The question I must ask myself is, shall I marry him? That is so, is it not, Father? Certainly, my dear. Let it be so. Since Mr. Bounderby likes to take me thus, I am satisfied to accept his proposal. Tell him that that was my answer, will you, Father? Tell him word for word, if you please, Father. Of course, my dear. There is perhaps one other question I should ask. You have not entertained in secret any other proposal. Father, what other proposal could have been made to me? Where have I been? Whom have I seen? What are my heart's experiences? My dear Louisa, you correct me justly. What do I know of tastes or fancies, of aspirations or affections, of, of all that part of my nature in which such light things might have been nourished? You've been so careful of me, Father, that I never had a child's heart. You have trained me so well that I never dreamed a child's dream. You have dealt with me so wisely, Father, from my cradle to this hour that I never had a child's belief or a child's fear. Oh, my dear Louisa, you abundantly repay my care. Kiss me, my child. And so father and daughter went down to the drawing room where Mrs. Gradgrind was recumbent as usual while Sissy worked beside her. Mrs. Gradgrind, allow me to present Mrs. Bounderby. Oh, so you have settled it. Well, my dear Louisa, I only hope that your health may be good. For if your head begins to split the moment you are married, which was the case with mine, I cannot consider that you are to be envied. Though I have no doubt you think you are, as all girls do. Now, Louisa, <laughs> as to the wedding, all I ask is, and I ask it with a, a fluttering in my chest which actually descends to the soles of my feet, that it may take place soon. Otherwise, I know it is going to be one of those subjects that, that I never hear the last of. <laughs> And so, eight weeks later, the day came, as all other days come to those people who will only stick to reason. And when it came, there were married in the church, Josiah Bounderby Esquire of Coketown, to Louisa, eldest daughter of Thomas Gradgrind of Stone Lodge. Shortly after a nuptial breakfast, as they were going on a trip to Lyon, in order that Mr. Bounderby might take the opportunity of seeing how the hands got on in those parts, and whether they too required to be fed with gold spoons, the happy pair departed for the railroad. The bride, in passing downstairs, dressed for her journey, found young Tom waiting for her, flushed either with his feelings or the vinous part of the breakfast. I say, Lou, what a game girl you are to be such a first-rate sister. Mm -hmm. Oh, time's up. Oh, Bounderby's quite ready. Goodbye. I shall be on the lookout for you when you come back. I say, Lou, ain't it uncommonly jolly now? Upon these words, Louisa and Mr. Bounderby depart for their honeymoon, and the first book of Hard Times ends. But Sissy Jupe remains behind to sink or swim in a sea of facts, and Stephen Blackpool remains behind to struggle through another hopeless day of toil and disappointment. And the works of Coketown remain behind 
to grind and rumble and belch their fumes into every chink and corner of earth below and every atom of sky above. Change of scene the heart may lighten, but for us there is no change. Belts and pulleys I revolve in, where the weary 